So welcome everyone. Um, we are going to be together for the next while. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about emotion-focused family therapy, but we're going to be targeting more specifically emotion coaching in the context of eating disorders. So my name is Adele LaFrance and I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm also the co-developer of EFFT. If you want to access more information about the model or available resources, those websites um, are good links to check out. So first of all, before we get started, the spirit of this work together is contained perfectly in that sentence. If what you're doing is working, keep doing it. So there are times when I work with caregivers or clinicians and I propose new strategies and it kind of rubs up against parts of the self that are uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I want to really just reiterate to you, if it doesn't fit, you know, um, don't feel like you need to adopt it. And especially if what you're doing is working, I don't want you to change the way you're doing it. Keep doing it. Unless you feel like what I'm going to present today can enhance it. And in that case, that would be great. So this is really kind of like an integrative model in terms of what you're already doing. A bit of background. There have been some pretty great advances that have been made in the field in the last 15 years. We've worked really hard to understand how to better structure treatment for eating disorders, but we can't, I can't go on without admitting talking about the fact that the field is emerging from a pretty dark history around parent blame in eating disorders. So like other disorders, for example, autism, schizophrenia, parents were not seen as the solution. Parents were seen as the cause. And that lasted too long. And unfortunately, there's still remnants of that today that we're working to um, evolve from. But thankfully, thanks to the work of Yvonne Eisler, Janet Treasure, Locke and LaGrange, and others, we found that caregiver involvement is actually one of the best treatment ingredients to um, improve outcomes. And that's much more popular with individuals struggling with eating disorders who are of child age or of adolescent age, not necessarily the norm among adult populations. Um, and so uh, that's something that we're continuing to work on as a field so that we can kind of move toward individually focused treatment to more family-based focused treatment, no matter the age of the individual affected by the eating disorder. Now, why do we want to look at that um, in a really kind of serious way? Well, first of all, eating disorders involve behavioral symptoms that happen outside of the treatment program that happen in the home. And so behavioral support is needed outside of the therapy. Similarly, eating disorders are um, now being understood as emotion converters or emotion processing tools in that symptoms serve to manage, process, regulate stress and distress, which means that the more help an individual can get with emotion processing, the better, because it'll make it so that they're less likely to turn to symptoms um, to manage whatever's going on for them. The third point, and in my opinion, the point that is the most compelling, um, is that when we look at the neuroscience of caregiver and loved one brain reactivity, it's not even comparable to the reactivity with a therapist, for example. So I'll illustrate it um, with this. If on my best day, I have a therapy session with your loved one, it will have a positive impact probably because we know that therapy works. There are many, many studies that show that to be true. However, if I teach you a fraction 
of the skills that I have, you know, in my training as a psychologist, and you implement those skills and you do it imperfectly, a lot of mistakes, it will still have a far more positive impact because of the neurobiological bond that exists between you and your loved one. Um, this is true for parents. This is true for step parents. This is true for um, grandparents, relatives. This is true for romantic partners, spouses. So anytime there, there's been an, an intense bonding, uh, then we can leverage that bond for transformation. Other practical considerations for caregiver involvement? Well, and some of you may already know this, some people refuse treatment or they drop out. And then what? So if we only rely on individual, individually focused therapies to support individuals with eating disorders, and there's no medical reason to mandate their participation in treatment, if they refuse or drop out, we all feel pretty helpless. And so when we systematically involve caregivers and we offer you skills and techniques, the very same ones we would use in the therapy office, we have way more hope for being able to reach those people and even re-engage them um, if possible. The other Practical consideration for caregiver involvement has to do with your rights. You have the right to support. And that is so true in the context of eating disorders where eating disorders are high stress, high stakes illnesses. And when there's a high stakes, high stress illness in the home, family patterns reorganize, caregiving styles are influenced, and there are higher degrees of stress and burden in the folks who offer the caring, so you. That means you need to have an outlet for support as well. And in fact, there are places in the world where if your loved one has a serious physical or mental health issue and you're involved in caregiving in a significant way, regardless of your loved one's desire for your involvement, you have the right to a needs assessment at the very least, and you have the right to become involved in specific ways. The number one reason to involve caregivers in treatment, improved outcomes for everyone involved. When parents and caregivers are taught specific skills to support their loved one, their loved one actually experiences reductions in their eating disorder symptoms, and improve quality of life. If they have to go to hospital, hospital stays are shorter. There's less conflict and strong emotion in the family. And relevant to you, less caregiver burden. What is most detrimental to the mental health of a parent or caregiver is to witness a loved one suffering and feel helpless or ineffective in the face of it. So when I propose caregiver involvement to some um, individuals, some parents, caregivers, spouses. Sometimes I get looks like, oh, please, no, I can't possibly do anything more. I'm already so stressed. I'm already so burdened. And that's a reality, you know, so that's, it's not an exaggeration. And so I want to remind people of this quote, what the predictor, the strongest predictor of the stress and the burden is not actually the time spent caregiving, it's whether or not the caregiving feels like it's worthwhile, feels like it's effective. That means in EFFT, yes, we want you to invite, we want to invite you to um, become agents of healing, but we don't necessarily want you to do more. Instead, the first goal is for you to do different. And so I'm gonna just briefly overview the different modules of EFFT. How do we want you to do different? What do we want you to do differently? What do we want to teach you to do? Well, number one, behavior coaching, and that is to decrease symptoms and increase health-focused behaviors. So those of you who know the work of Locke and the Grange with family-based treatment is very, very similar to the, to the principles of phase one, where parents and caregivers are asked to take an active role 
in um, meal support and symptom interruption. The second module is emotion coaching. And in this module, parents and caregivers are taught specific skills to support the processing of emotion fueling symptoms. So that could be, I'm scared to eat this piece of cake, or that could be, I'm scared to be angry with anyone. Um, if the emotional process is interfering with health and recovery, then that's where emotion coaching comes in. Healing wounds. There are different reasons to um, enact the module on healing wounds, but today I'm just going to talk about one of them. Because in EFFT, um, we use the relationship as a vehicle for change in the context of interpersonal neurobiology, the stronger the relationship, the stronger the vehicle for change. And so you may have a stressed relationship with your loved one, or you may have a really, really good one. Regardless of the situation in which you find yourself, we would propose that strengthening the relationship will also strengthen the vehicle for change. We also want to help you work through any blocks that might arise in the process of supporting your loved one with behavior coaching, emotion coaching, or healing wounds. Okay. And blocks are mostly related to fear and self-blame. Um, I'll never forget the first time I proposed to a caregiver that they engage in regular meal support with their loved one. And they looked at me with wide eyes and what I found out ultimately was that they were terrified of pushing their child to eat more. They were terrified of pushing their child to increase a variety of foods, to include foods that no longer were part of the menu. Because when they did, they could see their child's distress. And that distress terrified them because their child could feel suicidal at times. And so this notion that they would engage in support that could increase suicidality was completely paralyzing. And, you know, they told me like, yeah, we try to find ways to cut corners to do less because we don't want that worst case scenario to happen. We would never be able to live with ourselves. And so um, in those cases, then we want to support caregivers so that they can extract themselves from the rock and the hard place so that they can find options to support their loved one while also um, making sure that they are safe from themselves from suicidality, for example. Now that's one example of a block. There are different variations of blocks. So some people are afraid of doing emotion coaching in case they do it wrong and they make it worse. Or some people are afraid of doing meal support in, in case it causes too much stress in the family and it leads to a marital breakdown. So any sort of fear or block that kind of makes you go, ooh, don't do it. Part of the EFFT model is to help you to move through those blocks so that you can feel free and flexible um, to follow your caregiving instincts and to support your loved one in these different ways. Now, guess what? <laughs> Caregivers are not the only one with blocks. Clinicians have them too. The only criterion for blocks is being human. It's the only one. So if you're human, you're going to experience blocks, especially in the context of eating disorders because they are high stress and high stakes. So clinicians may feel blocked in terms of treatment delivery. They may be afraid to you know, support you in different ways, or they might waver in their belief of you if they themselves are scared. And so rest assured in EFFT, it's not just caregivers who work through blocks. Clinicians are responsible for doing the same as well so that they can be the best therapists that they can be for you, for your loved one, for your family. Today, we're going to focus on emotion coaching for eating disorders, and I'm going to go through elements of the model. I'll um, demonstrate some 
some tricky situations. I'll provide you with some tips and tricks, and then we'll do a little bit of practice too. Okay. The short-term rationale for emotion coaching is captured in this metaphor. Emotion is like an elevator and the door to reason is on the ground floor. If emotion is high, you won't be able to reason with your loved one. They won't be able to engage effectively in problem solving. They'll be less likely to um, follow your redirections. Now, why is that important? I mean, there are so many reasons. At mealtimes, for example, if you're supporting your loved one to eat more and their fear is high and you remind them how important it is to eat and you kind of let them know all the reasons why, unfortunately, it's not going to land because the elevator is not on the main floor. The elevator is on the sixth or the seventh floor. And so emotion coaching can help bring your loved one down to the main floor so that you can have those reasonable conversations so that they can have a bit more flexibility to be redirected in the ways that are needed. Some of the short-term outcomes of emotion coaching include putting out the fire. I'm sure each one of you watching has vivid memories of a time where your loved one was highly escalated emotionally and it felt like nothing you could say or do would put out the fire. While emotion coaching is not the perfect fix, it doesn't work 100% of the time, it does show the most promise of anything that I've worked with. It can also avoid escalation. So if you see things ramping up, you can use the skills of emotion coaching that I'm going to introduce to make it so that you can start to go back down again, or at least stay in that zone where they are currently and, and avoid going too far up. It can de-escalate um, outbursts that are currently in progress. And perhaps most importantly, in the context of supporting your loved one with meal support with the symptom interruption piece, emotion coaching improves compliance and engagement. So let me talk to you a little bit about the how. This is a bit technical, but I feel like it's worthwhile going through because when you can visualize what's happening in the brain, it can help you to keep going even though you might be thinking to yourself, I don't think this is working. So when you use the skills of emotion coaching with your loved one, around meal times, let's say, okay? The verbal and nonverbal signals that you're showing trigger a release of oxytocin, okay? And oxytocin comes from the hypothalamus. That release of oxytocin goes into the limbic system and binds to receptors that are responsible for calming the emotional storm. So, you may not see anything change right in front of you right away, but you can be assured that inside the brain, it's almost like putting water on the fire. It's cooling down. And when the brain is calm, never mind the physiology, just when the brain is calmer, it's more flexible. And that means the individual, your loved one, is going to be more receptive to what you're asking them to do. And just so you know, um, some individuals are born with fewer receptors in their limbic system. And so they need more of this kind of support throughout their life to help their brain calm. Some people think that the capacity to regulate our emotions is like this developmental progress process so that with age we become better able to regulate our emotions and in a way that's true um, because the structures in our brain that help us with regulation mature every year okay and they don't become fully mature until about mid-20s so yes there's a developmental process associated with regulation however it only goes so far um, without the support of co-regulation. So emotion regulation 
develops through co-regulation. And unfortunately, because some individuals are born with fewer receptors, for example, they need more of that co-regulation in order to be able to internalize the capacity to self-regulate. So the good news is that when you use the skill of emotion coaching with your loved one over and over again, not only does it create a more flexible brain, a brain that is more capable of engaging in problem solving and more capable of appreciating logic, when you do that over and over again, it also increases the capacity for your loved one to be able to integrate within themselves the skills to do it on their own. So in this little image, you can see there's a bridge and the bridge goes from the front of the head to that middle section. So those areas are the frontal lobe and the limbic system. How does this happen? How does it kind of internalize? Well, when you engage with your loved one like this over and again, your efforts actually promote brain building activity. Okay, so building blocks of the brain show up and build connections between the parts of the brain that are involved in regulation. So the emotions kind of come from the limbic system, the frontal lobe is thought to quiet the emotions, and so that bridge gets built between those two structures. That is fascinating. And I'm just so encouraged by that because for a long time, I'll be honest, I didn't completely understand how the process happened. I knew it did, I would see it happening, but I wasn't sure how. And so I asked some neuroscientists to help me understand. And parents would come in and spouses would come in and they say like, I don't think it's working. I don't know that it's working. Like she didn't say anything or he didn't respond to my efforts or, and I would just say like, keep going, keep going. It will change, you know? And now I can say, this is how, this is why. Keep going because you're promoting the creation of a bridge and a bridge that's very necessary in the context of eating disorders because if your loved one can build and strengthen their capacity to regulate stress and distress, remember we talked about earlier, they will not need to engage with eating disorder symptoms as often, if at all, because they will be able to draw on those internal resources um, to manage when things aren't going well. Okay, one last point about emotion coaching. Not doing it did not lead you here, but doing it can get you out. I haven't even presented the skills of emotion coaching from EFFT yet. And the reason why is because I need to say this part first. When I started teaching caregivers these specific emotion coaching skills, so many of them would feel terrible because they would say to themselves or to me, I've never spoken to my loved one like that. No wonder they have an eating disorder. And so I am here to tell you that nobody consistently speaks to their loved ones like this. It's not the way we were taught. It's not the way we were conditioned. Um, and so it's not the cause of eating disorders. Otherwise, everyone in North America would have an eating disorder because our parents wouldn't have known to do this either, okay? So not doing it did not lead you here, but doing it can help get you out. It can pave a road out of the illness, along with other tools, skills, strategies, supports, of course. But emotion coaching can really be a huge helper in that process. All right, so here are the steps. And um, there used to be five steps, but I've narrowed them to two because the five steps were pretty overwhelming for some people. And they were really focused on emotion, whereas I imagine some of you can relate with this. Your loved one's not always saying, hey, I feel scared or hey, I feel sad. Sometimes it's, I just don't want to eat that or I don't want to recover or I feel fat. 
And so it's never so straightforward, you know? And so this model of emotion coaching can be used in all kinds of situations, whether the individual is presenting with an emotion or a thought or an urge, okay? So step one of the model is to, is to validate. And validation in this context means conveying understanding of the experience and proving that you get it. And I'll unpack that in a little bit. The second step in the model is support. Providing emotional support and then practical support. The order is critical. Validation first, emotional support next, practical support after that. I can't emphasize that enough. In order for it to work, and for it to work as effectively and as efficiently as we want, that order is really important. So I'm gonna invite you to just take a breath, close your eyes, settle into yourself, and we're gonna do a mental exercise. I'm gonna read a sentence and I just want you to say inside of your head what pops in your first impulse without thinking about it. And by the way, I do this activity with clinicians and we pretty much all come up with the same answers. All right, so here we go. I don't wanna recover. I don't want my parents involved. I don't want you involved. I wanna purge. The eating disorder and all the issues that come with it, they're my fault. I will never recover. I'd be better off dead. I hate you. I will never speak to you about this. Now, if you're like 99.9% .9 of the general population, your responses may have sounded like, of course you want to recover. I'm going to be involved no matter what. No, sweetie, don't purge. The eating disorder is not your fault. It's not anybody's fault. One day you'll be able to get there. No, you wouldn't be better off dead. You hate me? That's okay. I'm still going to be here for you. I'll never speak to you about this. I'll wait it out. Or I'll find you a therapist. So those impulsive reactions are the result of cultural conditioning. That's it. That's how we are conditioned in North American culture to respond to um, sentences like what's on this slide. So the goal here is to be aware of how conditioned we are in terms of our response style so that we can turn right instead of turning left. So left is what we've been conditioned to say as a result of being a part of North American culture. Whereas right, turning right, represents this new style of responding that is more likely to increase flexibility in the brain and uh, promote regulation in the service of healing and recovery. Okay, so back to step one. There's a little problem with the word validation because there are so many definitions about what it means to validate that the first thing we need to do is establish a shared definition. Okay. And this I learned over time because I would work with caregivers and clinicians both and they would say to me, I validate all the time, it's not working. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so bizarre because I believe in the neuroscience of it, I've seen it, and so I don't know how to make sense of this. And then what I learned was that there literally are different definitions of what it means to validate. So first step, share definition. I'll present to you a script, okay? I can understand why you might feel, think, want, okay? So that's the beginning of a validating statement. I can understand why you might feel, think, want. Now. There is a trap that comes. Which three letter word are you now tempted to utter? And again, this is to demonstrate conditioning. This is a common 
conditioned response. I can understand why you might feel sad or I can understand why you might want to have symptoms, but the but just wants to fly out of our mouth. In the context of step one, validation, there is no but. Instead, and this is a really great little trick to help you as you develop um, your skills using this new language, you move from, to become, from but to because. I can understand why you might feel sad, why you want, might want to engage in symptoms, because. You want to aim for three different becauses. I can understand why you might feel sad because you were really looking forward to seeing your friends and because you know they're going to be having a good time and they're going to be talking about this weekend and you know you're going to feel left out and because you're not sure when you're going to be able to see them again but to because it's a subtle shift with a tremendous impact now let's look at the again the rationale when the external environment mirrors the internal experience the alarm bells in the brain reduce in intensity so that's when the oxytocin gets released by the hypothalamus and it, and it binds to those receptors so when you can say i can understand why you might feel think or want x because and you name the becauses from your loved one's point of view the external environment mirrors your loved one's internal experience, the brain says, oh, okay, they get it. We can, we can reduce the sound of the alarm. And it's not a conscious choice. This happens unconsciously. Right? This is at the, a cellular level. And so you might have reservations about speaking to your loved one like that, but know that it's grounded in the science of regulation. So I can understand why you might feel, think, want, because, 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 okay? And I'll show you with a visual how that is. Let's say, uh, we'll use a meal support one because that's so common with eating disorders. Your um, loved one is terrified of eating pizza. And that fear is like this castle inside of them. And the castle is well fortified. And that fear is alive and dark. When you use the skill of validation, what you're doing is you're opening up the door to that castle of fear. I can imagine you might feel scared to eat that piece of pizza because you haven't eaten pizza in a really long time. And because you try to avoid dairy as much as possible, and because you promised yourself you wouldn't eat foods like that ever again. I can imagine you might be afraid to eat that pizza because you might feel really uncomfortable afterwards, or because you're worried that you're gonna have an urge to get rid of it somehow. I can imagine why you wouldn't want to eat that pizza. So it opens the door to the castle. It starts to move through the fortification of that castle. Now, we don't end there. Remember, it's a two-step process. So validation opens the door so that you can now put in your emotional and practical support and it's more likely to have an effect. So if you do those validating statements, three, four, five of them, and then you say, sweetie, I'm gonna be here with you. I believe in you. I know you can do this. And why don't I sit next to you and I you know, play some music to distract you or we play a card game. Now that the validation opened the door, when you offer the emotional and the practical support, it's much, much more likely to have the desired effect. Now, if you go straight to emotional and practical support, unfortunately, it's going to be like throwing a tennis ball against a brick wall. The door is not open. So it's, it's going to be much less likely to be received, if that makes sense. 
So validation is opening up that door, creating this openness, this flexibility. So then when you come in with comfort, with reassurance, with practical support, distraction, or even setting limits, your chances of it having the desired effect go way, way up. I can't tell you how this changed my practice. I remember early in my days as an eating disorder a psychologist, parents, caregivers would come in and tell me that they had massive fights, plates went flying, kids ran away, and I didn't know really how to help them other than to say, it's the eating disorder, you know, keep fighting, keep fighting. Well, when I discovered this element and the power of this technique, it was such a relief for me as a clinician because now I could say, okay, this is what we can do to help calm that emotional storm, to avoid those escalations and to make it much, much more likely that your loved one is going to be receptive to your supportive efforts. So step two, practically speaking, what does it look like? You know, it's funny. In some ways, it's what you're inclined to do naturally. It's what you're inclined to do first, maybe. Someone feels sad, you offer some soothing, some comfort, whether it's verbal or physical with a hug or a touch on the shoulder. If the person feels angry, believe it or not, when they feel heard, when they feel understood, Sometimes that is the emotional support of anger. Sometimes they need a little bit of space. Now, it doesn't need to be in a separate room or a separate home. Space can be in the space between you. Um, sometimes there needs to be some boundaries, and that's okay. So you can help your loved one to set some boundaries that are not going to interfere with their recovery. Uh, emotional support with shame or with anxiety, reassurance, but not before you validate. You know, so often when individuals present with shame or anxiety, again, our impulses go straight to reassurance. But if the door is not open, the reassurance is not going to go in. It's not going to kind of tackle that shame, that anxiety in a way that's healing because the door is not open. Practical support, setting limits, redirecting, exposures, you know, so if, if your loved one hasn't eaten a food for a really long time and you've all agreed that it's a good idea for them to reintroduce this food into their diet, helping them bit by bit to build up to that is a way to offer practical support, problem solving, taking over. Those are all ways to offer support practically. Now, these steps, these two steps, they can take five minutes, they can take 60 seconds to implement. So they're not meant to be, um, you know, super long in, du in duration. Validating with three, four, five becauses, a couple of sentences um, of, of support and some practical support, it doesn't have to take long. Sometimes it will take longer and sometimes you'll need to cycle back through the validation. Um, but eventually that flexibility will, um, will take place. Um, even though you might not see it at first, okay? Because remember, it's not necessarily a conscious process. It's the brain reacting to the signals. So it's going to happen. Okay, so a couple practical tips about um, emotion coaching here. The validation is critical. It, the investment in the validation predicts the outcome, opens the vault for step two to enter. But don't forget, it's a step two-step process. So some people get really excited about the validation and the becauses, but then they forget to give the emotional support and to offer that practical support. So it's a two-step process, validate, support. Next, go through the open door. Now, what does that mean? Let's say your loved one is angry. And you say, I can see you're angry. And I don't blame you for being angry. Because, because, because. And they say, I'm not angry. I'm disappointed. Okay. Go back and validate disappointed. Yeah, I could understand why you might feel disappointed. Because, because, because. In other words, 
go through the open door, the door that is open to you. Um, and it may not even be an emotion. You might say to someone, oh, it looks like you're scared of eating that. I'm not scared. I just don't like it. Validate the fact that they don't like it. I can understand why you wouldn't like it because, because, because. You might be able to go underneath to what you think is really going on, but you want to walk through the door that's open to you first. Next, play darts, okay? What does playing darts mean? Think about a dartboard. Every time you throw your dart, you're aiming for the middle, but if you don't hit the bullseye, you still get points. You want to do the same thing with validation. You won't always know why your loved one is feeling the way they do especially if it's something that you feel is defies logic you know it's not gonna come to you naturally but if you can make some educated guesses you'll still get some points for so many reasons so number one making educated guesses is going to be more effective than asking questions so, so many of us are inclined to kind of like ask, well, why, why, why do you feel that way? Because you don't want to get it wrong. You want to respect their process or you just don't know. And research has shown that an educated guess is always better um, than a question. One of the reasons why, especially for your loved ones, is that if there has been an eating disorder around for a long time, the individual with the eating disorder has been using symptoms to manage stress and distress. And so they have been separate from their emotional world for so long that if you ask them, how are you feeling? Some of them won't have an answer. I don't know. Like, I actually don't know. And so when you can make educated guesses, what happens is that you allow them the opportunity to bounce things off of their internal experience. Like, huh, does that fit for me? Oh, yeah, I am scared of that. Or yeah, I am angry about that. And so it actually increases their emotional literacy. And the more literate they are emotionally, the more capable they are of managing their emotions, the less likely they are to have to use symptoms. So play darts, make educated guesses, okay? And then finally, be ready for whack-a-mole. So what does whack-a-mole mean? Let's say you are validating your loved one's urge to purge. I can understand or I can imagine why you would want to purge because, because, because. And he says to you, why are you talking to me like that? You never talk to me like that. What's up? Whack-a-mole. Now you validate that. Oh, yeah. I bet you're feeling a bit suspicious because this is so different than how I've normally reacted. And I can imagine it might feel a little bit weird because you're not really sure how to take it. So do you see validation whack-a-mole? Sometimes parents will do the validation and then their child will come out with a sentence like that that shuts them down or, no, that's not true. And then they feel like, oh, it didn't work. But they forget that emotion coaching is a cyclical process, okay? So you do it once and then depending on what happens next, you do it again, you do it again. You will not have to do it for perpetuity, okay? It's not gonna be a never-ending process. Um, especially at the very beginning, um, because this is a whole new way of relating to your loved one. So it will seem weird to them at first, and they will kind of be suspicious or like wondering if you're trying to be like their therapist or something. Validate that, like, oh yeah, I can imagine it might feel weird because this is not how we normally talk to each other. And eventually, the need for the whack-a-mole validation will go down significantly, okay? But at the beginning um, phases, expect it's gonna happen, just, you know, uh, wash, rinse, repeat, okay? Validate, support, repeat. Number three, work towards approaching nonverbals for maximum effectiveness. So I don't know about you, but when I was taught how to support someone who felt angry, like, when in my training as a psychologist, I was taught to remain calm. So if they're escalated, you remain calm, okay? And it works, but not always. Sometimes remaining calm actually escalates the other. And so 
what we found is that if you can work towards um, mirroring the nonverbals, it will actually increase the regulating effect of your emotion coaching. So if someone's sad and go like, oh yeah, I can understand why you might feel sad because, because, because. If someone's scared, you're like, oh yeah, I can see why you might be scared because of this, because of this, because of this, and angry. Yes, no wonder you're angry. When I put myself in your shoes, I get it because of this, because of this, and because of this. When you do that, if you think about the alarm center in your loved one's brain, okay, sound the alarm, there's a problem, and you reflect with your nonverbals, with your tone, your volume, your face, your body, yeah, I get it. Then the internal operator of the alarm says, okay, okay, we've been heard. We can start to cool the jets. So it's this really cool neurophysiological trick to increase the efforts or increase the effectiveness of your efforts. Four, use tentative language grounded in sincerity. I cannot emphasize that point enough. So the script I gave you at the beginning starts with, I understand, right? Some of you um, listening will think to yourselves, mm, that's not going to be a good word for me because my loved one doesn't like to be told how they're feeling, okay? So in that situation, you would use the words like, I imagine when I put myself in your shoes, I could see that this might be something that you're feeling. Now, if your loved one's not sensitive to, you know, um, words like I understand, go for it. it. It can work really, really well. So often parents and caregivers will ask, like, if I talk to them like that, they're going to think that I'm making fun of them or I'm being condescending. And so then my advice would be like, well, just check in, you know, is it really coming from a place of sincerity? Are you really trying to kind of understand where they're coming from? And if so, you're good. And if they respond with, oh, that feels so condescending, then you validate that. Number five, you need to practice. This is not something that will come naturally because we have been conditioned to turn left, where this is the equivalent of turning right. So imagine you have worked in the same building for 20 years. And your drive to work has been the same for 20 years. And then one day they announce relocation. Now you're going to be working on the other side of town. And when you drive to work, I can guarantee you that there will be times when you turn left to go to your old building rather than turning right because your brain was conditioned to do that. Same thing with emotion coaching. Um, I attended a webinar earlier today where a clinician who was learning the skills of emotion coaching to teach to other people was saying that anytime she'd get stumped, didn't know what to say, she'd write it down in a notebook. And then later when she was feeling calm, she would try to fill out the validating statement and then think about ways to provide emotional support, think about ways to, to provide practical support so it could strengthen her um, ability to do so in the moment. When I teach parents and caregivers these skills in session, I never teach it without practicing over and over and over again, um, because we have to create new neural pathways. It's not because people are slow learners, it's because our brain was not wired to do so, and we have to create an override okay, as part of the system. And then finally, validation as a stance versus a strategy. So I was speaking with a, a parent a while ago and they had used these skills in the context of meal support and symptom interruption for their teenagers um, uh, healing from an eating disorder. And the parent said to me, you know, it worked really, really well at the beginning. Like we couldn't even believe how well it worked. And then after about three, four months, it lost its impact and I'm not sure what happened. And in conversation with that parent, we realized that they moved from validation as a stance, like really trying to kind of 
convey understanding of their, of their loved one's experience with sincerity to more of a rote strategy. So it's, it lost its heart. It lost its soul. So it wasn't working as well. And so I want to invite you to, of course, consider using the skills of emotion coaching as a strategy, especially in the recovery from eating disorders, but also to try to embody the stance to bring in that heart and soul to increase the effectiveness of the intervention. A couple of other questions or issues that have come up in my work teaching um, parents the skills of emotion coaching. So one of them is why, why is it so hard? Because we're drawn to fix things. And emotion coaching doesn't mean that we don't fix things. No way. <laughs> The step two, practical support, is very much in that domain. But the validating step is not one that we're typically used to doing. We're typically going, uh, typically used to going straight to fixing. And believe it or not, sometimes the biggest part of the problem is not the problem itself. It's the emotional experience around the problem. So... Let's say, um, you know, someone's struggling with a relationship and they're feeling really, really, really sad about something that happened in the relationship, you know, and we're like, oh, let's try this to fix it. Try this to fix it. Well, maybe there's nothing to fix. Maybe the biggest problem is feeling overwhelmed with this sadness. And so once I get support to manage the sadness, things aren't so bad. So, um, so do keep that in mind that sometimes the biggest part of the problem is that the emotions associated with your problem feel too big to handle. Okay. Um, the other reason why validating is hard is because we're drawn to validate what we feel is true. And uh, many parents and caregivers, and I've experienced this myself, I've been like, oh, if I validate that, won't I sound like I'm agreeing with them? And so inspired by those questions and our own, you know, concerns or fears, um, we've put together a demonstration to show you that agreement is really different from validation. And when we look at it like this, like in black and white, literally, we can see how different they are. So let's say your loved one has a painful experience and they come to you and they say, oh, I'm a loser. Nobody likes me. I don't have any friends. Agreement would sound like, yeah, yeah, you're a loser. You don't have any friends. Whereas validation would say, I could imagine you might feel really lonely. Everyone wants to feel like they've got a good social support network. And that sounds really hard. And then emotional support, so comfort, reassurance, and then practical support. Let's go do something or let me help you to problem solve what's going on. Likewise, your loved one says, I want to have symptoms. Agreement would be like, I agree, you should, which of course is absurd. And instead, validation can be like, yeah, sounds like you feel pretty overwhelmed. And when I put myself in your shoes, I can imagine you'd be drawn to symptoms to get a little relief because you've been in treatment for a while now and you're still feeling so bad. Emotional support, comfort, reassurance, practical support, redirection, distraction, something like that. So that is the difference, agreement versus validation. Very, very, very different animals. Okay, so here are some practical examples. Resistance. What's your first impulse? Just say it in your head. When your loved one says, I don't want to recover. I don't want your help. And now let's look at the structure. I can imagine why you wouldn't want to recover because... It seems so overwhelming to live without the eating disorder. It has been a constant companion and it has really helped you to get through some really tough stuff. I can understand why you wouldn't want to recover because the roadblocks on the way towards recovery seem so daunting and you're so tired of fighting the fight. Emotional support, comfort, reassurance. I'm here. I believe in you. I know you can do this. You have been working so hard and those efforts are not going to be for nothing. Practical support. <sighs> Let's do something really relaxed and chill tonight. 
and give you a break from thinking about how hard all of this is. We'll do the meal, then we're gonna do something fun. Now, I don't want your help. This one can trigger a lot in parents and caregivers, especially when they feel helpless. You know, they don't know what to do and, and the rejection feels scary, right? Paradoxically, validating why it is your loved one doesn't want your help will increase the likelihood that they will accept it. They may not accept it with open arms. It may still be, you know, with hesitation or begrudgingly, but they are more likely to accept the help. And we do know that when caregivers are involved in these specific ways, outcomes are better. So yeah, I don't blame you for not wanting my help because it feels so embarrassing to need meal support, you know, at your age. And I can imagine that, you know, you feel like you want to take charge of your own life. Like you want your independence. And I can imagine you wouldn't want my help because I haven't always said the right thing or I've not always known what to do. And so I could imagine that you might not trust me 100%. Emotional support, reassurance, comfort. I'm going to be here with you. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to figure this out. I am going to make mistakes, but I'm going to keep on getting up and supporting you. And I'm going to get, you know, some practical support and check in with the, um, with the group leaders, with the therapists, you know, I'm going to check out those webinars and uh, we're going to figure this out in a good way. Let's try another one with urge for symptoms. I want to restrict, binge, purge over exercise. I want to cut. I want to get drunk or high. I want to lay in bed all day. I want to do my rituals. Any one of these. It seems so counterintuitive to validate that, doesn't it? But remember the neuroscience. Validating it, followed up by emotional and practical support, is going to be much less effective, much more effective rather, than trying to convince or um, uh, use logic or set limits right off the get-go. Validate first. I can understand why you would want to restrict your food intake because when you restrict your food intake, it does numb. It does numb what's going on inside. It gives you a break, it takes the edge off, the stress, the distress. So it makes sense to me. And I can understand why you'd wanna restrict your food intake, food intake because there's so many foods that are so scary and fear is overwhelming. It makes sense that you'd wanna stay away from X, Y, Z. And then emotional support, of course, and practical support. So you start to kind of get a sense for this language and again, it's so weird, you know, like I would have never guessed to respond to people in this way to create change, um, but it, it actually works. And so that's encouraging because it can be something new that you've tried. Now, all of this work has really shown me that my understanding of motivation was not complete. So um, some of you may be aware of the stages of change, um, Proshatkan Declemente stages of change. And so they say that people find themselves in different, different phases or stages of motivation to heal, to recover. And in this context would be from an eating disorder. So pre-contemplation means the person is not interested in recovery. Contemplation, well, maybe. Preparation, huh, well, you know what, I'm gonna start thinking about it, I'm gonna start making some plans, making, you know, doing some preparations to kind of consider moving forward. Action is doing, and the maintenance stage is keep it going, okay? So those are the stages of change. Now, if your loved one is in pre-contemplation, you might say to yourself, well, she or he has no motivation for recovery or in contemplation, she or he has some motivation for recovery, but it's not translating into action just yet. I wanna propose 
a slightly um, different conceptualization of motivation in the stages of change. Not to take away from any of what's here, we will keep that all intact, but we'll add a layer to it. So this expanded view of motivation is that, yeah, okay, your, your loved one might be in pre-contemplation when it comes to recovery. In other words, not interested. But what I want you to consider is that what's fueling that stage, what's fueling that pre-contemplation, what's fueling that no, is that the fear associated with engaging in the ta tasks of recovery or the shame associated with eating more is unbearable. And therefore they can't imagine engaging in the tasks of recovery because they don't think they can manage the emotions that come with it. So recall earlier, I talked about how the problem is really the problem. The problem is the emotions associated with the problem. Here's a perfect example. Some of your loved ones will be so, so resistant to um, having you involved because they might be really, really afraid that if you see how unwell they are, that you might feel disappointed or you might get scared or you might judge them or criticize them and they don't feel like they can handle that. Or they might be resistant to having you involved because they um, are afraid of stressing you out or they are, they're afraid of burdening you or they are afraid of, of making it so that you actually become ill yourself because of the stress. And then of course they wouldn't be able to live with themselves if they felt that way. So if your loved one is presenting with low motivation, tell yourself that what's fueling that low motivation is some sort of fear or shame and an inability to manage those emotional states, or at least they fear that they won't be able to manage those emotional states. And so they don't want to go there, which makes, your role as their emotion coach all the more relevant because you can be there for them when those big emotions arise, when that fear of recovery arises, when that fear of gaining weight arises to help them move through the fear, move through the shame. And so, you know, emotions are not static processes. They are continuous, they flow if they are allowed to flow. If they're pushed down or suppressed, yeah, they, be, they remain stagnant and you know, unproductive, unhelpful, maladaptive. But otherwise, like healthy emotion rises and passes. And so if you can support your loved one to um, work through the fear as it rises, with the validation, those three becauses, that emotional support, that practical support, the fear will subside. And then they will be able to take that next step towards recovery in a, in a much easier way. So that's how I think about motivation, whether it's pre-contemplation or even maintenance, fear and shame, and the fear of fear, the fear of shame ends up being a powerful driver that you can um, help to manage in a really, really good way. Anger, we use the very same formula, but I want you to know that it is really, really, really hard to validate and support anger when it is being blasted towards us, okay? So um, that's really important to remember. It is 100% natural to feel defensive or deflated when someone we love and someone we're trying to help, um, you know, comes at us with pretty intense anger. Um, however, what you need to know is that it's the same formula, okay? You need to approach your other's volume, tone, and energy, and you can let that air out of the balloon. Okay? Let's say that you're in the desert and um, you're in the desert and then there's a snake and the snake bites your loved one. And it's a venomous snake. No hospitals for miles around, no help for miles around. What do you wanna to do? To help them, you want to get the venom out. So you wanna suck the venom out. Anger is the same. You wanna let the air out of the anger balloon using that same formula that we talked about. 
I don't blame you for feeling angry because it feels like your life is not your own. And it feels like we're treating you like a baby and you can't even make a decision about what you're eating for dinner. I don't blame you for being angry because people are pushing you to do things that you don't feel ready to do. Doing that in, will have an effect in the other of calm of getting that anger out, of letting that air out of the balloon. So you don't meet anger with anger, you meet anger with validation, but with that lovely energy. Okay, so I'll do a quick summary here. Emotion coaching in the context of eating disorders is a skill that requires practice. It's not gonna come naturally, I can promise you that, because it is counter conditioning. It goes against everything we've been taught. It even goes against the messages that we get in the media, it's not a perfect solution. It's not going to work 100% of the time. It's not going to give a perfect result either, even when it does work. But, and like I said earlier, it's the best thing I've found with possible outcomes being de-escalating outbursts, decreasing resistance and conflict, increasing treatment engagement, compliance, flexibility. It makes it so that you're less likely to use more invasive procedures to ensure that your loved one gets the care, support, food, nutrition that they need. Over time, they have much more self-efficacy with emotion and self-regulation. It also improves your relationship. So when you use this, after you get over those initial hurdles of like, why are you talking to me like this? And oh my gosh, this feels so awkward. The relationship will improve. And if you conceptualize the relationship as the vehicle for change, that is a really, really good thing. And then finally, emotion coaching improves your own self-efficacy as caregivers because it works a lot of the time. And so then it's like, oh, okay, I've got something here. Took me a while to get there, took me some practicing, but now I've got it. And yeah, it does work more often than anything else I've tried. So that's a really good feeling too. Okay, so those are the principal takeaways um, from this section on emotion coaching. For more information, including access to videos on so many of these topics, visit mentalhealthfoundations.ca, and the .ca is missing here, um, and you'll find lots of support. And then, of course, seek out the services in your community so that you can help to deepen all of this.